Hello and welcome to Calvary Chapel Comic Key. Today's the 25th of June, 2022, and we will continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. Today is chapter 16, the last chapter, and the Lord willing, we'll get through the whole chapter. It's actually a short chapter, and really the homework will be kind of um, a situation that if you, de if you decide to do it, you're going to have to use probably extra biblical information uh, maybe especially through the internet. You know, we live in the information age and uh, there's lots of information out there that we can get to, including stuff about the Bible. But um, I'll mention the homework later on uh, as we go through. So let's look at Mark chapter 16, starting with verse 1. I think what I'll do is I'll read the whole chapter and then we'll talk about a few points. But I, I want to finish with kind of a an outline uh, having to do with kind of the last instructions the Lord gave his disciples, then ultimately us before he ascended into heaven. And so we'll see that as we progress. Let's look at chapter 16 of Mark, chap uh, verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, verse 3, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Verse 12, after that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And then it finishes with Amen. So that's... Mark chapter 16. So, so we'll just go through it verse by verse. I don't have really a whole lot of input until we get to the end. And, and we'll talk about really uh, the Lord's last instructions to his disciples uh, before he ascended into heaven. And, and we're going to uh, see what all of the Gospels and even uh, the book of Acts says about that. And so let's go through it verse by verse. As we finish up the Gospel of Mark, how about that? I think it's been probably over a year since we started. And so it says, now when the Sabbath was passed, and we know that uh, there, this was a special time period, not only the, the Sabbath of the weekend, if you will, Friday night to Saturday night, but also there was the Passover involved in all of this. 
So it was a very special time. Remember, Jerusalem would have been um, overcrowded with visitors from all over the known world, especially Jews from everywhere would come in. And that's going to happen even uh, when we get into the book of Acts. You know, we see right after that um, the Feast of Pentecost would be very similar uh, crowded situations. And we see that the first people mentioned uh, that are actually going to take care of Jesus' dead body, that's what they had in mind, was, were women, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. And you can compare the other Gospels and you can kind of piece things together, uh, especially when you compare the, the harmony of the Gospels. You can make a timeline of what happened uh, you know, on this first day of the week. And so it says very early in the morning. So it's the first day of the week, and we know that's Sunday morning. Uh, they came to the tomb, and when the sun had risen, so it's a sunrise thing. That's why, you know, on Resurrection Sunday, we like to have a sunrise service, you know. Uh, it reminds us of what happened on that very first uh, morning, uh, that Sunday morning, uh, as Jesus has defeated death. Verse 3, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone? Now we know... Uh, at the very end of verse 4, the reason they're talking about it is apparently they knew there was a very heavy stone that's uh, blocking the entrance into the tomb. Uh, and, uh, and so that was on their mind. And so, uh, but they looked up and the stone had already been rolled away in verse 4. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man. Now we know from um, even other translations, this turns out to be an angel clothed in a long white robe sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed, you know, and of course, that would be normal. But he said to them, do not be alarmed, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I love that, uh, right to the point. And, and you know what? Um, the world at large, whether they know it or not, is seeking truth, and we know from the Word of God that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so as people at large in the world are seeking truth, we already know the answer. We can say, you're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, and that's what this angel says, and who was crucified, so that actually happened. He actually died because of crucifixion, his body did. But he says, he is risen. He is risen, he is alive, he has defeated death. That's a huge um, statement there. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples in verse 7, and Peter specifically, we see, Peter is a disciple, um, that he is going before you into Galilee. So remember, this is now in Jerusalem, and Galilee would be in the northern part of Israel. Uh, there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, let me pause there, because this will be, now I'm going to insert the homework if you choose to do this. This is going to be uh, a big, big assignment, uh, depending on how deep you want to go. Um, apparently, at uh, the end of verse 8, there's some manuscripts that say that's the end of the story. That's the end of the chapter. That's the end of the book of Mark. So it ends abruptly uh, where it says in verse 8, So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Period. Okay, so in your research, uh, you can you just use a search engine on, on your internet, and you can, uh, you can just uh, search for Mark chapter 16. You're going to find information that has to do with manuscript evidence. Uh, for the book of Mark and specifically for chapter 16. Now, I can tell you, I'll give you a hint, there's thousands of manuscript evidence uh, for all of, uh, we're talking about specifically for the New Testament, and there's hundreds for the book of Mark, specifically chapter 16. I'm going to give you a hint. There's only two manuscripts that uh, end at verse 8. The rest, in general, go all the way to our verse 20, the way that we have it in our Bible. Now, sadly, uh, some Bibles will indicate that 
the two most reliable or because they're the oldest manuscripts, which they indicate would make them more reliable, they don't, they stop at verse eight. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we should go by. But I can tell you that uh, just because manuscripts could be older doesn't mean they're necessar necessarily more reliable. But I'm gonna leave you to that research. research. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, maybe specifically a question that you can find out is, what are the names of the two manuscripts that uh, end with verse eight? Okay, so of the over 600 manuscripts that we have for Mark chapter 16, for example, only two of those hundreds stop at verse eight. Uh, also in your research, you can find out that the, what we would call the early church fathers through the, you know, the first, second, third centuries, uh, many of them refer to the completed through verse 20 section of this last chapter. Uh, so obviously they had in their, uh, their writings the complete through verse 20 of Mark 16. And so there's that. Uh, that can be really in depth. Now, uh, you can also find um, a really good Bible teacher, Bible scholar by the name of David Hawking. And uh, he teaches through what's called uh, this course called the History and Authenticity of the Bible. And so he speaks of these things about the manuscripts and, and how we get the Bible, how we get the canon, they call it, of the Bible. How was the Bible ratified? How was it, you know, decided of what we have in our hands called the Bible? And so it's the, the history and authenticity of the Bible by David Hawking. And you're going to find that. You, you can search that on your internet. But I know uh, for sure you can find that on... Uh, the website, it's called Blue Letter Bible, and that's a Calvary Chapel uh, organization. So the Blue Letter Bible on the internet, and, and then you can find out from uh, this teaching from David Hawking uh, about the Bible and how it, it uh, came to be. And so uh, that course, I think there's at least 17 lessons. It's at a very in-depth, like a college university type of level of teaching. But uh, my wife and I went through that years ago, and it really opened your eyes to, you know, what the, how we can trust the Bible. So I would recommend that if you're interested. And so I'm glad that that's now on video. You can pause this. You can rewind it. You can, you know, okay, what did he say? You know, so David Hawking is the teacher, and, and you're going to find that on the Blue Letter Bible. Okay, so, so I'm going to put that to rest, and we're going to continue on now with verse 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and the other Gospels confirm that. So from verse 9 to verse 20, we can, we can actually confirm um, these verses with other scripture and other books of the Bible. And he appeared to her uh, out of whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. Remember, <laughs> there's a group of people, they're praying and whatever, they're weeping, they're mourning. And, and the sad part is they're not receiving the information that he's alive. And so Jesus will actually scold them for that, for their disbelief. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. I speculate that in the culture there, uh, because it was a woman reporting back, they didn't believe because that's what their culture uh, kind of, uh, accepted. Uh, not, not that Jesus accepted that. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that the woman has a very special place in God's heart and has, uh, you know, all the rights as anyone else in Christ. It's Christ in us, our hope of glory. Verse 12, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And we can compare that to the road to um, Emmaus. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Sad. Verse 14, later, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief. Uh, that word unbelief can be translated disobedience and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, so here's, here's 
the ending of Mark and some instructions, some direction from the Lord to his disciples. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, so let's clear up some confusion here. We're not saved by baptism. We get baptized because we are saved. Uh, baptism in the water is a picture of the death, burial, and then uh, resurrection of Jesus. You go into the water. Uh, it's a picture. It's a type of uh, being buried. And then you come up out of the water. It's a type, a picture of the resurrection. But that all happens as a public confession because of what's already happened in your heart. When we receive the Lord, uh, now we're baptized. It's like a, a public confession of what's already happened in your heart. And so I wanted to clear that up just one more time. But he who does not believe will be condemned. We know from the Gospel of John that the Lord didn't come to condemn the world. In fact, he makes it very clear that you're already condemned in your sins. And so he came so that we might have life and that more abundantly, the Bible says, because it's Jesus in us. It's not a prosperity gospel, but our life in him, regardless of circumstances or situations, it's an abundant life because we have the power of the Holy Spirit now residing in us and we walk and are led by the Spirit. It says in verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out all they will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and they will drink. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now we see that many of these things happened with the disciples, even the apostle Paul who came on the scene later. Remember he was Saul, he was persecuting the church and he had an experience firsthand with the Lord on his way to Damascus to take uh, captive the Christians there. And uh, Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? So we see that uh, the church, the body of Christ, is very dear in the heart of Christ himself. He's the head of the church, we see in Ephesians. And so when the church is being persecuted, Jesus takes that personal, why are you persecuting me, he asked Saul. And Saul asked, well, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And so, so we see in Scripture that many wonderful, exciting, uh, miraculous things happen in the lives of the apostles. As, as Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave them a promise to send the Holy Spirit. Then the church is born at Pentecost. We see that in the book of Acts. And then they go about, they, they follow the instruction, the direction of Jesus, and they're going out into the world and they're they're spreading the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is. And as they're doing that, many times there were miracles. Now, uh, I truly believe that God is a God of miracles. I believe that he can do anything that he wants to, even today, right now in this moment. Uh, and as a reminder, remember, even salvation is a miracle. Uh, where we c come out of darkness into the marvelous light of who Jesus is, that's a miracle. Uh, all based on who Jesus is and the free gift of grace and then the faith that we have as a measure of Romans 12, 3 comes into play and, and the Holy Spirit now makes us alive that our, our dead spirit uh, in our flesh, in our carnal life now becomes alive again in the Lord and now the Lord resides in us. It's all a miracle. But I, I want to kind of capture, okay, all these things happening, you know, Speaking of poison and, and uh, drinking deadly things uh, won't hurt them. It reminds me of my time in Las Vegas, in inner city Las Vegas, and uh, how uh, just being in, in places where even the police would say, you probably shouldn't go there. It's too dangerous. Uh, but a sense of calling, and when you step into the Lord's calling, it's like you're going home. It's exactly where you're supposed to be. And there will be absolutely a spiritual, a supernatural, um, even protection from God himself. If, if he's called you to go somewhere to do something, uh, there may be fear. It may even be somewhat legitimate. But if the Lord's called you to do something and to go into a place that could even be dangerous, the Lord's going to protect you. He's going to work it out. Uh, and so ultimately, the, the truth is, even if I die in my calling, being obedient to the call of the Lord, 
then I know I'm going to be with the Lord immediately anyway. I'm going to be absent from this body and present with the Lord. And we know that in Paul's writings as well. Uh, so, so as a snapshot, uh, all of verses 15 through 18, this direction or instruction or even calling, you might call it, from the Lord, is going to be worked out individually. So we know that the Lord wants to use his creation and so when we step into the realm of the kingdom of God, and now we're uh, directed by the Holy Spirit, and, and we're in the word, and, and we're growing in the grace and knowledge of who Jesus is, the Lord will call us to do things. And it could be for a moment, it could be for an extended period of time, it doesn't matter. And really, what's, what's our uh, place in all that? And that would be obedience. We want to be obedient to the calling of the Holy Spirit. And so... We see direction there. So we're going to spend a little bit more time here in a minute with all this. But let's just finish up verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Speaking of, you know, Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the earth. Uh, he was that perfect Lamb of God, that sacrifice that only uh, he could do. Taking all the sin upon the uh, uh, of the earth past, present, future upon himself, experiencing even the wrath of his father in uh, like a final punishment of all sin and, and Je Jesus being the, the perfect sacrifice and then defeating death and then ascending into heaven as he's ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of majesty, we see really this stamp of approval that God the Father is saying, yes, you're the one. You did it. Uh, you did it perfectly. It's a finished work. Uh, and so now we just put our trust in that finished work. And they went out and preached everywhere in verse 20, the Lord working with them and confining the word, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And then finally, amen. Okay, so I want to finish up with this little exercise as we look at the ending of the four gospels and then we look at the beginning of the book of Acts you know, kind of where the church is born or what, what was happening and all of that. And, and we can put it all together. And it, and it really uh, paints a beautiful picture of, of our, um, our life in the Lord. And there's things that we can do as he's calling us, you know, from out of darkness always into his marvelous light. So, so if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 28, we're going to look at the end of all four Gospels, and we're going to see this like commission from the Lord himself, not only on his 11 disciples who will become apostles at this point, but also for us. And it's really a powerful thing. So in Matthew 28, 19, we have what's called the Great Commission. And the Bible says, uh, Jesus speaking, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So let me read a note that I have attached. Uh, and so th that passage in Matthew, I see that we are to produce. And let me describe that. So we should be making disciples. We should be producing disciples. So as we're a disciple of Christ, we're a learner of him, uh, we're, we're pressed into him, we're in the word, we're surrendered to the spirit, and all that that makes us a disciple, we are also commanded to make disciples. So we're always going to be a disciple of Christ, uh, at, at least until we're with him. But it, it's probably going to be forever and ever. He's always going to be our perfect Messiah, our perfect shepherd. Uh, so we should produce disciples. I have some notes that I made. Uh, healthy sheep reproduce. So, so the Bible sometimes uh, compares us to sheep, uh, even those of us in Christ. You know, he's our shepherd and we are his sheep and we know his voice. Well, healthy sheep reproduce. And that's the picture of making disciples. Uh, we are to be fruitful, you know, producing fruit uh, as we're commanded to love God and to love others and we're denying ourselves. The fruit that the Lord produces in our life isn't for us. It's going to be for the people around us. Uh, but it answers the question, now what? You know, you come to the cross and you find Jesus uh, right there. He's loved us from eternity past and he's taking care of our sin problem. He puts us on a new path. He gives us instruction. So now what do we do? Um, what do I do now that I've been to the cross is the question. And where do I 
And where do I make disciples? And the answer is anywhere. So as we're going, therefore, make disciples. Literally, that's how it can be translated. And so as I'm going about my normal business, as I'm living my life in Christ, uh, making disciples will be supernaturally natural because, see, the Lord has developed now the gospel in my life, and now my story is connected with that. I have a, I have a personal story, and the Holy Spirit makes me a bold witness to the glory of God's grace. So that's Matthew 28, 19 and further. So we see uh, this idea of producing, making disciples. And in our passage today in Mark, you know, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so, so in a way we should be preaching. Now, not everyone's a gifted t uh, pastor teacher and preaching officially, but our life should be a reflection of who Jesus is in us. So my life really, just living it out, is preaching to the world. You know, if you're a dad, uh, your life is preaching to your wife and to your children, especially the way that you're living your life. Uh, you know, and uh, that includes then everyone that comes into your, into your realm, into your circle. So we're preaching the gospel, and it answers the question, how do I do that? It's how do I... Uh, how do I preach the gospel? It's by the way that uh, I'm just surrendered to the Lord. And so, uh, and, and who do I preach it to? Um, what's the message? Uh, it's the gospel, the good news of Jesus. It must be the correct message. So we, it's not anything made up. It, the good news is that I, uh, starts with the bad news, that sin has devastated my life and I'm on my way to a real place called hell then the Holy Spirit comes in and convicts me of my sin and judgment and righteousness from the, the Gospel of John. And, and so now uh, I come to the end of myself, I invite the Holy Spirit to come in as I'm surrendered. I put my faith in Jesus. Uh, there's this turnabout called repentance, you know, as the, the Holy Spirit enables me, and now I'm on a new path. So, so we're preaching to anyone and everyone that would come into, uh, into our life and, and just as a hint, it's, it's going to be centered on Jesus and who he is. You know, who is Jesus? Who is the Jesus of the Bible? And so, you know, we, we know from the Gospel of John that Jesus is full of grace and truth. It's a perfect balance. Grace is a, a free gift that we can't earn. And then there's truth in that we see that the Bible says that Jesus is truth. And so it's completely about Jesus. Then in Luke chapter 24 verse 49. So we've talked about producing disciples and preaching the gospel. Let's, let's look at this promise that we see in Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with the power from on high. So we have this promise. Now, Big tough fisherman Peter, you know, he writes about all these precious promises. So there's multiple promises, but there's a specific one in Luke. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit, and they were to wait until uh, Jerusalem. So, so it's interesting. So the end of Matthew, uh, Jesus says, "Go therefore and make disciples." But then, but then there's a quick uh, before the sentence is finished. But wait in, in Jerusalem until I send the Holy Spirit. If we go without the Holy Spirit, then we're just going to make a mess. We can't go and, and produce uh, disciples without the Holy Spirit. We can't um, preach the gospel in any kind of powerful way without the Holy Spirit. So Luke says, wait for the promise of the Spirit from God and answers my doubts and fears. See, on my own in my flesh, I don't have a chance. But with the Holy Spirit, I now become a bold witness. And it's all glory to him. Uh, so there's these exceedingly great and precious promises that's throughout Scripture, and Jesus is the message of promise. See, Jesus, when he left, he promised that he will return, and so we can count upon that. So, so if he's returning at a time that no one knows, then I want to be the one that's ready for his return. And so I need the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, so they're waiting for the promise, and then... It, in John chapter 21, we see that it's very personal. And so at the end of John 21, it's not a, it doesn't necessarily come across as a very clear uh, like direction, but, but we, can, we can actually see that if we look just a little bit carefully. In John 21, 
Uh, so remember, Peter has now denied Christ three times, just like Jesus said. And then Jesus goes to the cross. And now Jesus is on the earth in his resurrected body, and he's now restoring Peter uh, through this um, last chapter in the Gospel of John. He asks uh, Peter three times, do you love me? And there's that conversation. And then it leads into, uh, let me read from verse 20 of John 21. Verse 20, then Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the apostle John following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper. Remember the last supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seeing him said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? So, so the Lord in verse 18 indicates how Peter's going to die. And it, it really leads to uh, crucifixion. Remember, tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down. He said that he wasn't worthy to die right side up like Jesus did. And, and so in verse 19, uh, Jesus spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. I want you to hear that personal call. It's the same for all of us, not just for Peter. Jesus says, follow me. Remember when Jesus uh, picked his disciples, he went out and about and he hand selected them. Uh, completely different from a typical rabbi. A rabbi, even in Jesus' day, especially the popular ones, would have a waiting list of people wanting to be their follower, to learn from them. Jesus did it differently. He went out and he picked these men. And it's the same today. He's still handpicking us. He handpicks us. He saves us. He says, follow me. We have a choice. If we choose, yes, Lord, I want to follow you, then now we're his. We, we have the right or the authority or the power to be called a son of God now. And we're following Jesus in this life and we're his disciple. And so, so the Lord indicates how Peter's going to die. And then Peter says, well, what about John? How, you know, how's he going to die? And uh, in verse 22, Jesus answers that. Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? So Jesus isn't saying that um, John's not going to die, but we know from, uh, from history that John was really the only one of the, the disciples that lived to an old age, probably in his 90s. He's the one that wrote the book of Revelation, for example. Um, but so Jesus ends that with, you know, what is that to you? He says again to Peter, you follow me. So you see, it's personal. Our calling, uh, you know, in these, in the gospels is to go therefore and make disciples. Uh, we're to preach the gospel. Uh, we're to wait for the promise of the spirit. We absolutely need the Holy Spirit. And so it's, uh, he's promised to us. Uh, and now in John, we see that it's personal. And I, I have some notes here. We have a personal relationship with him. Answer the questions like, they are more gifted, or I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you know, that I can le legitimately say in my life, following the Lord, there's so many people um, that are teaching the gospel that do it so much better than me. You know, or, or just comparing myself to someone else. And, and Jesus would say, just like he did to Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. See, the Lord uh, will gift us specifically, uniquely for his glory and to, so that we can love him better and to love others. And so, so it's personal. And then finally, in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see where we get our power. And so it's actually the promise of the Spirit uh, actually happens in the book of Acts chapter 1. We see the church is born. Um, and in verse 8, the Bible says from Jesus, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, so power from the Holy Spirit. We have power from God, and it answers the question, how can I be a disciple? How can I preach the gospel? How can I even believe God's promises to me? How can I follow Christ personally? It is Christ in us, our hope of glory from Colossians 1.27. Uh, it is his power in me that makes me a powerful, bold witness for him. And I say amen to that. So, so instruction from the Lord, from the Gospels and into the book of Acts, 
Uh, we're to produce disciples. We're to preach the gospel. We wait for the promise of the Spirit. It's a personal thing, and now we have power from God. It's the Holy Spirit upon us uh, to overflowing, and that's an ongoing thing. Keep on being filled by the Holy Spirit, we see in Ephesians. And so, so I hope that's a blessing. I know that uh, for me, going through the book of Mark has been a blessing to me verse by verse. And I, I hope that's true for you as well. And so uh, I'm going to be on a little bit of a break. My wife and I will travel to the United States for uh, some time with our families. And uh, when I get back, I already have a plan of action. Uh, I'll, I will make videos of, of concerning our Sunday morning messages with questions if you like to pursue some Bible study on your own. And then, uh, you know, keep that all in prayer. And so... Uh, be blessed, be encouraged, be in the word, be in prayer. Uh, you know, we have these resources that are so powerful. You know, we have the word of God, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the privilege of prayer. Those three things really make us even very powerful uh, in a world that's decaying and dark. And just as a reminder, this world is not our home. And we're waiting for the king to return for his, his people the church. So let's be ready for that. And so until next time, God bless.